Hey, Tim. Hey, Alex. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing well. We like, went from the, your booth to the second floor to the third floor, found a corner, just kind of set up. People look at you a little bit like, well, you know, then you set up and then you just become part of it. Well, and, and the thing is, is that I'm actually waiting for someone to show up and just kind of like, <laughs> just <laughs> do one of these things, do something just because. <laughs> yeah, because, of course. <laughs> So you guys just uh, did a survey. Um, I'm with here, Tim Mackey, and with Synopsis. And uh, Tim, you've been saying you've been on the road a lot. I, I guess you've been on the road. I think almost a reflection of this. It's almost a reflection on the survey you just did as well. Kind of the research results of this survey that you've done on you know your customers and you know and open users of of software components, as I understand. Yeah, so the, what we released today is the Open Source Security Risk Assessment Report. This is our fourth edition of this report, and it's a, effectively a reflection of the yeah, use of open the source, um, the composition of open source building up today's application stack. Um, so if I'm in a commercial application, I'm not just writing my own code. Uh, yes, I am, but I'm going to be using libraries that are available from open source. I'm going to be building on top of frameworks that are available to me that give me all of the value that I want to have while allowing me to be unique in whatever my feature function set is. So that's the basis of the uh, the OSRA report. And so it looks at what we on the Black Duck Audit Services team um, have seen in the real world in m &A or VC type activity. Okay, so m and and VC type activity are one of your targets? Uh, so we have one aspect. Is that your business? So that's one aspect of our business. So, right. Uh, if someone wants to go and acquire a company, right. and uh, they're going to spend X number of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on this, they want to have some aspect of confidence that says, you know what, the IP that I'm buying is what I understand it to be. I know that open source is going to be part of the equation today. What's the line between what is the unique IP versus the open source components that are uh, in here? What is the development acumen? How old are these components? Are being patched properly? Where do they come from? Are they still being maintained? A lot of these types of questions are the things that we can answer. And then of course, do I have appropriate uh, license? Is there provenance behind this code that allows me to go forward and say, aha, I'm going to execute this deal. So so what are you finding? Is the code, is the code working out there? The code is very much working out there. Um, we're seeing a growth in open source adoption. Um, we have an uptick in the number of open source components per code base. Last year it was pretty significant. Uh, we saw a decrease in the number of vulnerabilities that were unpatched. Yeah. Those are all positives. Yes. Uh, we did see our share of negatives, as you kind of would expect. Yeah. Um, one of the most notable uh, being that um, we had a pretty substantial number of components that were just ancient. They were yeah. four years old. There was no development activity that's, in the last couple of years. And it's like uh, with the velocity of everything today, that is truly ancient. Um, and the challenge... I thought Libra was ancient. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to give you an even better example. I'm going to give you an even better example in a second. Uh, but what we found is that um, when we peel back the onion, people think that there's a vendor, that there's this vendor of open source. Yeah. And they are accustomed to thinking... Uh -huh. How would you bring software libraries of one form or another into your supply chain? It's like, well, I go to Microsoft and I buy the code, or I buy the compiler, and it comes with these things, and Microsoft knows that I exist because I bought this. It can push updates to me. That kind of push mechanism. It's not the way open source works. Mm. And shifting the paradigm to being an engaged one is really where we're seeing the companies that did well in improving things understood that I have to be engaged within the open source community. I have to be willing to invest developer time to understand what the latest and greatest uh, evolution of Kubernetes or Docker or a library. So theoretically, you can't ignore the community to run open source components. You absolutely have to be part of the community. You have to understand what your critical components are. Check. Check. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you end up in, here's the really interesting. Here's part. what we decided. Uh, yeah. Um, community one. Community one. We actually had a component that we uh, FreeBSD was like three version three three had a vulnerability that was disclosed in 1990. <laughs> so half of the developers at this conference were probably not even born when this vulnerability was disclosed. 
What was it? Um, it was a vulnerability in the, it was a buffer overflow. Okay. In how term cap was processed. Term cap. Give us a give us a so brief background on term capabilities cap. of a, uh, a text-based terminal. Well, I, those text-based terminals did have a place in the market back in 1990. Yeah, exactly, and so those little workstations. Mm -hmm. And so this was very simply a straight-up buffer overflow. <laughs> if you put the wrong amount of data into it, it would go poof. <laughs> if you put too much text into it, it would just go. Exactly. Boing. Exactly, and so. FreeBSD, much more modern versions are available today. Uh -huh. It was what was working. Yeah. This is one of the other problems that we see is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is this, I, you find them still in use, or you just find them just way back in the closet? So this was still in use. <laughs> How is it, it being it used? Was, it was quite literally, this is the platform on which the software is being deployed. Mm. And at the end of the day, it wasn't broken. Mm. So nobody saw any real need to update it. And yes, it probably <laughs> fell in their minds into the legacy camp, but this is part of the assets that were being acquired. And so... Gosh, there's so many songs. You, exactly. How do you update from that? T time's on my side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, the 90s were great. <laughs> <laughs> the 2000s were great. We're now approaching 2020. <laughs> and now we have serverless. And now we have serverless. And the paradigm shifts all the way through. And so one of the biggest things that we saw in terms of just the uh, components in use, jQuery rules the roost. When it comes to web-based applications, we saw no end of versions jQuery's of jQuery, it. jQuery's it. It's everywhere. There were forks upon forks upon forks of jQuery. And okay, it's the way the world seems to build their web-based applications. Mm. Second? Um, second biggest thing was um, an actual, uh, so it was in the Jackson code, uh -huh. it was a data bind issue, uh -huh. um, where they, uh, the community attempted to fix the issue three separate times. Three separate times. Um, it was basically, how do I deserialize data? Deserialize. Okay. Um, in a polymorphic manner. So in other words, I have this data set that's coming in from a something else and I want to deserialize it and I have enough knowledge to be able to perform this task. Now, turns out that there was a security issue with it. They patched it, didn't realize the scope of it, patched it a second time, still ran into a problem, decided that it was probably a whole lot easier if they refactored the code. And so we saw uh, separate code bases with each of those three vulnerabilities in an unpatched state. Um, and oh. so, again, that's a case of not necessarily being engaged within the Jackson community to know that this is what's happening and that there might be exposure. What was Jackson again? Jackson's part of a data binding set of libraries okay. to do uh, transformation of Java data structures into Java code. And, that, and that's more relevant now. Yeah. I mean, so. all, and it has historically. Yes. What are some emerging trends that do you see coming out of your own research? So the, the core thing that we see is that the more modern the code base is targeted, so if it's targeting an IoT device or if it's targeting, uh, say, a mobile application, what we see is that the overall, let's call it acumen, is much better, but the velocity of development now starts to prioritize new feature functions over keeping up to date with whatever the underlying security and development velocity of the open source components are. Okay. So that's where we see the majority. So the velocity is a... Is, a, is an issue. Mm, so if you've got... Is it say, too fast? Uh, or is it, it not right? process is what it needs. So if you, say, have 300 components that, that are open source in your project, and they're all independently evolving, and they're all potentially independently going to issue updates or security fixes or whatnot, um, knowing when to go and take what set of patches becomes a... A real challenge, more so when you think about how uh, there might be incompatible uh, patches. So it's not a case of, hey, I'm going to have a patch library someplace that I'm going to pull from and I'm arbitrarily going to be able to patch it. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting, yeah. So, uh, and this gets back to the, the vendor mentality that a lot of people have. Yeah, um, where the vendor will fix it. The vendor will fix it, or there's one patch out there. So let's say that you have a vulnerability that's in an open SSL, and there's uh, Red Hat's version of it, there's IBM's version of it, there's Canonical's version of it, and there's upstream. Nice and simple four scenarios. Can you take a patch 
that uh, the Debian community created and that nominally might be compatible with Ubuntu and apply it to Red Hat. Might work, might not work. Can you take an upstream patch and apply it to uh, Red Hat's version of OpenSSL? Might work, might not work. But in the vendor-centric world, there's only what would come from whoever we're paying the money to, and because open source doesn't necessarily have a change of currency, they don't know how to obtain those patches or where they should be coming from. And that's also one of the big things that we saw. How do container technologies fare kind of in your, your findings? Did you learn anything? We just had this incident, you know, with Docker Hub, and I'm, I don't, it, the connection is just, time is just the kind of where we are right now. This happened last week, and here we yeah. are. So. so in this particular um, analysis that we did, we weren't specifically looking, looking at the container for, technologies, yeah. but what we've historically seen is that organizations view the base image in a container as, quote, somebody else's problem. Oh. And so they worry about their code, and, oh, I've got a base image that just works. And if you actually peel back the onion and ask them the question, well, what's in that base image? Why do you require these user space components? What we end up with is, it works. It does what I need it to do. But does it have extra stuff? Is it potentially configured correctly in a mm. secure manner? Yeah. Whatever correctly might be in that yeah. particular industry and that re requirement. Well, I'm really worried about my application. That's somebody else's problem. And at that level, it becomes a trust factor. So we like the official images that are available in Docker Hub. But even if you take an official image, that was probably updated a few weeks ago. And that official image might not have all the latest patches. And so you have to make certain that your Docker file is taking care of whatever your patch management strategy is. Otherwise, you can get out of date just as easily as having VSD from 1990. Mm -hmm. And it really is a question of awareness. Right. So that organization that was content to have that old version of VSD, they didn't see the problem. It worked for them and did what they needed it to do, much in the same way as... Well, That's I, the context. Exactly. The base image is kind of is historically something that no one really wants to take responsibility for in many respects, right? Correct, and so Docker's done a pretty good job of taking responsibility for some of it, mm -hmm. um, and is working with various open source communities to have the official versions, have them appropriately security tested, um, have them appropriately signed, mm -hmm. and those are all good, important steps, but those are all point in time events. So if I go and I take that uh, container image that I'm going to use as my base image from a few weeks ago, if I'm not aware of what's in there, there could be a very serious uh, vulnerability that is available to a malicious actor. And it's that awareness that we really want to highlight. Open source is good, power is the world, but you have to manage it appropriately. Otherwise, you could be caught off guard and needlessly so. Yeah, it becomes a greater issue too is continuous integration, continuous delivery systems grow up as well with auto builds and mm -hmm. how how well you keep updated, right, versus OAuth 1 versus, you know, versus OAuth 2. It, it, exactly. And so understanding exactly what the capabilities are. So let's say that you had a library that only understood OAuth 1 and you wanted to bring it up to a more modern environment, you're probably not going to be able to just drop it in place and have everything work. You're going to have to refactor your code in some capacity in order to do the right things and actually process tokens correctly and so forth. That level of complexity gets uh, more difficult to progress with when you're further out of date. So if you take that example of code that hadn't been patched and had no development for two years, was that actually a main master branch that the code originated from or was that someone's fork and that someone did what they needed to make their application work? And you're not using the original. Done. Yeah. And so it's that level of doneness and community engagement that's really the hallmark of proper open source management. Right. It comes down to kind of like how branchy do you get? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. The, and, and the more you trim it back, the easier it is. Exactly. Like I, the canonical example that I use in a lot of my talks is, in my house, I assert that there's probably close to a dozen different versions of OpenSSL between phones and thermostats and DVRs and TVs and so forth. Most of them I'll have no way of knowing exactly what version they are because it's opaque. It's coming from, say, uh, my 
a satellite provider my TV right. and that sort of thing. But there's also no single patch for all of them. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Um, so tell us a little bit of conclusion on the study and you know what are your what are your plans now? Do you, do you continue to do the research? Are you is this an annual exercise? Is this historical from, from Black Duck's days? It, it is historical from Black Duck's days. Uh, this is the fourth uh, version of it, and we're going to continue doing it on an annual basis. Um, what we see in terms of core conclusions, number one, you can't patch something that you don't know you have. So forget the whole tooling side of the equation. If you don't have at least a reasonably up-to-date inventory of whatever's in the code, you can't even make a determination as to this is an important community for me to engage with. This is something that I need to be managing differently. Those are questions you can't uh, assess. Once you have that inventory, then it needs to be the responsibility of somebody to develop and implement policy to keep things up to date. Forget just the security aspect of it, just keeping it up to date so that you have the potential to just upgrade. So you can't. So you can't. Yeah. And then the, the last piece of this is very much engage with the communities right. um, because the communities are there but they don't push information they have it's a pull mechanism in open source if they don't know that you're dependent upon this they have no way of letting you know that hey you know what we've decided that we're end of life effectively version two of something and we're going to put all of our energy into version three and if you don't know that that's happening you could be left holding something you didn't really want to. yeah you better yeah and so, so that gets into like, how do you, you know, what are your proxies for keeping in touch? Because you need proxies at some point. And so that's where the prioritization really comes in. Like if you're using a lot of Docker technology, that's fantastic. Do you want to be upstream Docker and work with the Mobi project? Awesome. Let's get some of the developers engaged in it. Maybe it's also an opportunity to say, is it worth paying Docker the company to actually relieve some of that risk because this particular organization happens to be more so vendor some extra support exactly and same thing with a red hat or an ibm you can proxy through them a lot of the open source governance and then contain and control the pieces that are coming from the outside world tim thank you very much for taking some time to talk it's You're been welcome, a lot of fun Alex. you know and i appreciate you know you, you having the patience here Oh, but this is nice here on the fourth floor, though. I like it. Oh, yeah. It's like it's nice and quiet up here. Uh, not too many people have come by. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't interrupted you. Or me, either. For that matter, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot. You're welcome.